I just keep thinking about this scenario. So I decided that we probably need to put some visuals into what we're hearing. Hey guys, this is Jules with True Crime Reactions. As most of you guys know, I have posted a couple of videos regarding this, to me, new information that we are getting from Daniel from Drunk Turkey when it came to the interview that he did with Kaylee's mother, Christy, regarding what she was told about what took place that morning before the 911 call was made. And she's claiming that this information was given to her by Hunter Johnson, which is not to be compared to or mistaken for Ethan's brother, Hunter. It's not. It's the best friend, Hunter Johnson. I have been thinking about this a lot. It's really been, it's really been bothering me. It's really been bothering me. So I went back and I found a 3D thing of the house. So we're going to look at that. And then we're also going to look at that while we are looking at what the PCA states because there's a lot of people that have discrepancies on the information about where the bodies were actually found. And there's a couple of things about what these PCAs actually are that we probably need to discuss as well, because I think that people aren't understanding that there's a four hour difference between the 911 call being made with first responders showing up and when these detectives that wrote the PCA actually walked through the crime scene. So it's not impossible for things to look a little bit different whenever the detectives walk in than it did whenever, let's say, first responders got there. But let's just go ahead and get started with the layout and what we're hearing about Ethan. Okay, so I grabbed this off of Asgit's TikTok. Most of you guys have seen this. These were populating all over the place towards the beginning of the case because this TikToker went in and made these fantastically detailed 3D models of the home to try to give us sort of an idea of what it would look like for the person to walk through in the amount of time that the PCA is telling us this person walked through the house doing these things. But I wanted to go back and look at it so that we can maybe put some visuals on this new information about Ethan possibly blocking the door. So let's go ahead and just watch this together. So yeah, that was the original placement. And then we found out Dylan was actually on the second floor. Okay. Yes. Okay. So right here. Okay. Xana's door opens up against a wall. So it doesn't fully open up like a 180. It only opens up at a 90 degree angle. Okay. Yeah. I can see if Ethan was up against this wall that I could see how the door could only get opened a certain amount. And my biggest thing with that was the force that would have to be used. Like, I know a lot of people in the comments were like, well, if you got a door open and you saw the scene, you wouldn't open it up all the way either. Okay, yeah, obviously. But when we're hearing that they couldn't get the door open, so they had to call a guy over, and then that guy was still having issues getting the door open, in my mind, I've just visualized him putting as much force as he possibly could into the door, which to me would have meant that once he actually could have gotten it open, there would have been so much force used, it would have opened a lot more than just being able to peer through. But with this wall right here, if that's where Ethan was, which obviously that would have been the case, yeah. That actually makes, that makes a lot more sense now, honestly. Okay, let's just finish watching this. Let's see, it shows Murphy right here, but this is literally only because the PCA states that on the body cam of the first responders is whenever the officers found out that there was a dog inside of Kaylee's room. But I still question that so freaking much, man. But the dog would have been reacting a certain way. Okay. And there's some other things that people have mentioned about the smell. And yeah, I should have actually thought about this. It's a great, great point that if they really, and this is just based off of what we're being told. Okay. I don't need anyone to think that this is my actual opinion about what happened here, because if you've been paying attention to me at all, <laughs> you'd already know what my opinion is here for the most part. So this is me going based off of what we're being told right now. If at some point they really did go back to sleep, 
and they actually were asleep the entire time, you know, until the whole 911 situation happened. Not only were these doors seemingly closed, which would have stopped any smells of blood and any bodily fluids that did come out from kind of seeping all over the house as fast as you would think with four people, but senses do adapt. That is very true. So if they really were asleep for eight hours after the incident, while they were asleep, their bodies would have already become accustomed to what's going on. So while it, it might have been a little bit more prevalent as they walked towards the doors, it wouldn't have been something that they would have like opened their eyes and instantly realized because their bodies would have gotten used to it. But Hunter J for sure, and whoever else was there during that situation would have been hit in the face with it. That's the difference there. And I still stay with whoever else was there, whoever else showed up with Hunter. I went back to the original four press conferences that are on the Moscow PD's website itself. And I believe it was like in the second one that they posted, they made it really, really clear that the 911 call was made from inside the residence from one of the survivors phones and that the dispatcher spoke to multiple people who were already on the scene. So multiple people were on the call, multiple people were on the scene, multiple people showed up with Hunter J or Hunter isn't the only one that the girls actually reached out to. They reached out to multiple people because the police have told us they summoned friends, plural, more than one. And the only reiteration of the story that we're getting is all about Hunter J only. And I just don't believe that that's the case, not from the cops own mouths. It's just not the case. Okay, so now we're going to take that little video and we're going to compare it to the verbiage in the PCA. But I do want to remind everyone again that this is written by the accounts of detectives that showed up four hours after the 911 call. And we also need to remember that we have been told that EMS was not allowed inside. And the only way for that to be a valid response is if the first responders had assessed the scene well enough to know that there is nothing medically that could be done for what had happened. And in my opinion, because I don't know, but in my opinion, that would mean that the door to Zanna's room would have had to have been opened in some way in order for the first responders to have gotten inside and assessed both Ethan and Zanna. Because someone can look like they're gone, but then they still have a pulse, even though you can't tell. So those things would have had to have been assessed. Now, I know this is supposed to be like eight hours after the incident, so there would have been definite like things that the body would look like at that far into the entire process. But still, they have to truly, truly determine that. And I know that there's been a rumor about Ethan's pulse being checked by Hunter J. I have, I, I kind of doubt that that was the case, but there is one instance where I could see that being a possibility. We have heard on 911 calls that we've listened to that the dispatcher will ask the person making the 911 call to render aid of some sort. They'll ask for the pulse to be checked. They'll ask for CPR to be attempted. So there is a possibility that with this call going out as an unconscious person and the dispatcher not really being able to coherently tell how serious the situation was based on that unconscious person thing not matching the situation really, it's very possible that Hunter J was asked to do so. But that would also tell us that the door was open enough for him to have gone inside in order to do that. So I don't know. That's something that there's some questions about. But in my belief, I feel like the first responders would have maybe had to have, which is why to me, the door to Zanna's room would have been opened a lot more than Hunter J possibly could have gotten it open by the time four hours later, the detectives got there, if that makes sense. Okay, let's just go ahead and go through the verbiage. Okay, so it states right here. As I approached the room, I could see a body later identified as Kernodal's laying on the floor. Kernodal was deceased with wounds, which appear to have been caused by an edged weapon. And that is it. It is two sentences of details and only one with an actual location detail. Okay. As I approached the room, the room in which he was being taken to by Smith, which is Xana's room. Okay, that would be him walking this way to get to Zana's door. 
And that's why I say the door would have had to have been opened a lot more than someone just being able to peer inside to see that Ethan's body was blocking the door because walking towards the door and seeing someone laying like over here on the floor would make sense to me because it's as I approached the room. Therefore, you had to be like looking through an open door in order to see that. Okay. And then it states also in the room was a male. For some reason, even though I've already explained this, there's still a lot of people that have issues with this statement. This means also in the room that Xana's body was in was Ethan. Ethan was also in the same room that Xana was in. That's I don't, that's, I don't know how much more clear I can possibly make that. I don't know why people still think he was found in like the bathroom doorway or in the hallway. That's not what this says. It's just not. And I understand that there's a lot of things that we are questioning in this case that have valid reasons for questioning. But we also have to remember that everything right here is going to be backed up by crime scene photos. And those things are going to be compared and contrasted already. So if they haven't mentioned this, I mean, at this point, then I'm going to just go ahead and assume that this is accurate in the way that the bodies were found. Just because there's so many other conflicting things that there's so many different discussions that we can have doesn't mean that details like this are going to be technically wrong. But we also have to remember if there is something really sketchy about this situation, then not every single person that worked on this case or is involved in this story is involved in it. Okay. It only takes one domino to cause a mass effect. We need to remember that in this. Okay. Let's continue. Now this is the only statement about Ethan's location also in the room. So whenever you're going towards a room and you're seeing a body laying on the floor, as you're looking into the room as you're approaching the room and you're looking through an open door it is completely possible that he came this way towards the open door xana would have been over here somewhere and then as he approached the door and maybe had to look behind the door to wherever ethan was that's why ethan is mentioned last because people are saying okay well if he was blocking the door and he was in the doorway why isn't his body the one that the detective saw first? And that's a valid point. That's why I'm trying to figure that part out by, by looking at this. So if you're walking through and coming towards the door, the door is open and you see someone here to then say also in the room was a second body that tells me that you've had to maybe walk into the room and turned your head and out of viewable area of how the door was open you couldn't see that other person first. That's just kind of how it seems to me. Now, again, keep in mind that all of the scenarios that we're talking about here are just being based off of what this new detail is about. This doesn't mean that this is my opinion of exactly what happened. This is just how I'm seeing how it would make sense if this was actually the way that it went down. I'm going to look at the illogical and logical of everything here. Just because I can see some logic in what is being said and I can explain a couple of things to where it starts to make a little sense does not mean that I believe that it is the full truth. Whenever I've made up my mind, you guys will know. And I've had a lot of people asking me if I believe that Brian Koberger is the guy. The farthest that I will go to make a statement on that is to say that what we have seen via public information that has been posted from court documents, affidavits, search lists, inventory list, things that we have seen ourselves. I could not put this man on death row, not with the questions that I still have here. Now that can change just depending on what new valid details actually end up coming out. But that is my opinion as of right now. And I will also reiterate <laughs> Even though this eight hour delay in calling 911 seems hella suspicious and it is hella suspicious, there is also a great possibility that the murders themselves and the delay don't have anything to do with each other. Meaning that 
the murders could have happened. And then because of something that was inside the house that the roommates would have had to have possibly gotten rid of first before then doing what needed to actually be done could be a reason. I don't know. These are just things that I'm thinking about as we're getting all of these details and trying to make it make sense. And the main reason why the roommates are so suspicious is because there is something on their phones that the police department used as the end time of the incident, which was five minutes after the car left the neighborhood. That tells the public that at least one roommate had something on their phone to show there was something related to the incident that was part of the phone's activity five minutes after the suspect apparently left the neighborhood. That is a very important detail to me, and it's one that I am not going to let go of until we actually see the truth of it. And even then I might not let go of it because I don't care what anyone says. If you have something on your phone that can show the time of the ending incident of a quadruple homicide but then you don't call 911 until almost noon and it's actually put on the responsibility of someone else to call 911 that's a big issue to me until it's proven wrong and until then we're just going to keep asking questions now i still know that there's a lot of questions coming from this detail because of what we've heard from wsu kim and dave I am actually going to be addressing that probably in my next video. So yeah, we, we'll do that then. There's a whole scenario around that with the doors and the timings and the PCA and all, all this stuff. So we're going to try to talk about how that could possibly combine together because the stories that we're getting from the victim's families is there ain't no way anybody knew before apparently these people were called over about the door in Xana's room. But I don't know. There's something in the actual information that we have from the official documents in this case that still make me question if that could actually really be a thing, if people really could have known ahead of what we're hearing. But we'll talk about that later. See y'all.